I'm Jordan Blackman, and you're listening to Playmakers, the podcast where I interview game industry experts. This week, we have Brian Allgaier. He is a creator of games like Spyro the Dragon, Ratchet the Clank. Ratchet the Clank? Did I just say that? Ratchet and Clank and uh, Edge of Nowhere. We talk about what it's like to be a creative director and how to do it well, which actually pretty much impacts everyone who works in games. So definitely listen to this one. Let's talk about it a little bit more after the little sound. Today's guest is an incredible, incredible leader in creating some of the best third-person action platformer games of all time. When you think about some of the greatest third-person action games of all time, Ratchet and Clank has got to be on that list. And, you know, our guest, Brian Algier, creative director on Ratchet and Clank. And when you think about those games, you also, you know, got to think about Spyro the Dragon, which was just recently, I mean, it's in the news right now about people wanting a remaster of Spyro, which has got to be like a 15, 20 year old game. Spyro came out in 1998. So just shy of 20 years. And of course it needs a remake. And, you know, it's one of those games that when you meet a level designer and you talk to them, Spyro is often one of the games that they talk about as an inspiration. So, you know, both Spyro and both Ratchet and Clank have the touch of Brian, our guest today, who is a creative director at Insomniac, one of the creators of Ratchet and Clank, and has worked on, you know, Spyro, the Ratchet and Clank series, and the recent VR game, Edge of Nowhere. So this guy has an incredible resume and an incredible amount of experience just creating quality content year after year for decades. So it was a thrill to sit down with him and pick his brain about the art and the craft of creative direction and how that works at Insomniac. One of the first things that we talk about in the interview is how do you get every last drop out of the mechanics that you put in your game? And, you know, this is not the kind of thing you would immediately think of a creative director to be focused on. You, you might think he's just about bringing all sorts of big ideas to the game. But in fact, this was something that Brian brought up right away. So we talk about that. We also talk about the documentation and segmentation system that they created for, for Ration and Clank to be able to kind of plan out level by level, segment by segment, and what they call setup by setup. So you'll learn what that means in the interview. We talk about what it's really like to be a creative director, um, kind of day to day, and what the job really entails and what some of the challenges are. And we also talk about something that I think will be valuable to almost anyone, no matter what they do, which is how do you get the best work out of people who know more about their specific skill set than you do? You know, this is like a common situation in game development where you want to, you know, have a, a team member do something incredible and you want them to do it in a specific direction. You want to direct them, but you don't want to tell them exactly what to do. So we talk about the best way to approach that. And then Brian has a book that he recently released called Directing Video Games 101. And Brian shared several of the tactics and strategies that he discusses in that book. And those are really valuable as well. I bought the book. It's fantastic. I recommend that you do as well. You can find it at directingvideogames.com. You know, I just checked on Amazon and they're actually out of stock. So congratulations, Brian. And I'm sure you can still find it at directingvideogames.com. So while you're waiting for your copy, please do listen to this interview. And before we dive in, I just want to thank some of the people who've been writing us reviews. We're up to 36 five-star reviews. I really want to break that 50 review threshold. If you're thinking about writing a review, now is the time. Check this one out. We got from Space Sloth 2. It's really hard to listen to this in the car. I've had to pull over a few times, rewind and take notes because the info is spot on. Love that Space Loft too. Thank you very much. Video Syncratic, five stars. Great podcast with really interesting interviews and solid production value. Jordan's found exceptional guests with valuable and practical information on topics ranging across the full production cycle of a game. So, you know, I really much appreciate that Video Syncratic. And this episode, 
I believe falls squarely into that category. You are going to get an exceptional guest in Brian and valuable and practical information from this interview. So with all that said, let's dive into the interview with Brian Allgaier. Take me through the beginning of your career. How did you become you and how did you kind of fall into games? Yeah, the crazy thing is before Spyro, I think I'd worked in the industry for about eight years and worked on a bunch of games that a lot of people hadn't heard of. Um, I originally started working in games back in uh, early 92 uh, on Philips CDI projects. Mm -hmm. And so they had come out with a first CD-based console that had full motion video, which was like this crazy new thing. And I guess Philips and Sony at one point were in talks of joining together to create a console, and then Philips decided to split off and create their own console. And of course, then Sony went off and did the same. I was an artist and animator back then, working on 2D pixel artwork. I was the only artist on a game that was on the Hanna-Barbera characters. Um, There was uh, Huckleberry Hound and Scooby-Doo and Fred Flintstone, all that stuff. So I got the job by drawing Scooby-Doo at 16 pixels high, (laughs) animating. The fact that I could pull that off. Uh, got me the gig. That does sound hard. It's like a little favicon of of Scooby Doo. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was like all came came down to economy of design and picking your your pixels. And had you gone to school in art? Yeah, yeah. I went to Savannah College of Art and Design for a couple of years, and I majored in video and animation. And back then, they didn't have any kind of game design curriculum. Yeah, I was kind of all over the place back then. I guess when you're like, you know. You, when you're 18 or 19, you don't know what you want to do. And I dabbled in video, illustration. I programmed with my Commodore 64, tried to make little games here and there. I played a lot of games on my Commodore 64. Uh, but I didn't even think that was an option because I consider myself to be a more creative type. And back then, when you thought of game making, it was all programmers. It was like two or three programmers sitting in a garage, you know, programming. and Like the engineer creating the music and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And games were getting a little more sophisticated around that time, but I just didn't really think about it too much. And then I decided I wanted to come out to L.A. because I wanted to um, get into, like, filmmaking. And they only taught video. I remember one of the professors telling me that the future was video. Little did I know how right they were. (laughs) But I knew that making good films and the arts and craft of filmmaking, it was still, you could learn more out in Los Angeles at schools like USC or UCLA. So I just decided to like pack up and drive out here and I had a few leads. And then the opportunity came up where I could work at Philips Interactive Media as an artist because a lot of artists then were scared of using computers. Art and computers did not go together. I think Photoshop was barely just getting started. I happened to kind of like balance that line between the two. So that's, yeah, that's how I got that um, first job. And then from there, um, I eventually got into uh, design um, because I realized that I wasn't the greatest artist. I, and it, again, it was that kind of bridge between being more um, logical, uh, but also being artistic and combining kind of those two sides of the brain. Right. And, and level design, I mean, in a way, it's like making a giant sculpture. Yeah, it's thinking about the sequence of information, what the player is going to expect and how they're going to improve their skills and build on them. And that's something that I like to think a lot about. And frankly, I did not like being told what to draw. I kind of wanted to be the jerk who was <laughs> right. But I wanted to do it in a nice way. Uh, you know, I just get these random assignments. I'd put my heart and soul into drawing this stuff, and then it would end up getting canceled. And I kind of wish I was on the other side in those meeting rooms, understanding what the producers wanted. In the work that you've done, what's your proudest accomplishment? Uh, well, the biggest thing is absolutely the Ratchet and Clank series. I joined Insomniac back in '99, um, and then began working on the Spyro series. We started developing Ratchet and Clank after. Um, we initially dabbled in this other project for about a year. It was called Girl with a Stick. And that didn't quite... <laughs> working title. Out. Right. It wasn't very much a working title, but it just wasn't gaining traction or momentum. We decided to scrap it all and go back to our platforming roots and start focusing on developing Ratchet and Clank in a more action platformer style game. And I happened to be the only designer at the company at the time and ended up being the, des- the design director on the project. And I worked very closely with um, Mark Cerny, industry legend. Mm-hmm. And he taught me a lot about the nuts and bolts of design and just how you think about how you're very economical with your designs, how you're kind of careful about what you're planning, understanding how much it impacts production. And then also just those 
A plus B adding up the different skills and mechanics and how you layer all of those to progress difficulty and, and how the player learns and gradually progresses. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the aspect of economy that you mentioned learning from Mark. How does that work for you and him? Well, I think the, the key is, is that you can get a lot of mileage out of just a few assets and elements. You can take a few simple mechanics and combine them in very novel ways and really stretch out the experience. I think so often uh, junior designers think that they just have to keep entertaining the player and throwing new and interesting ideas at them. And they're not taking something all the way through to completion. You know, if you are teaching Ratchet, for example, how to use the um, swing shot and how he's like swinging through the city, um, there's a lot of different ways of mixing up how he's swinging, grabbing targets, launching, uh, landing on platforms, doing multiple swings in a row. So there's just lots of little atoms, I guess, that you can introduce that helps both the player learn and is also very economical for production. Like wringing the most value out of each individual mechanic and the mechanics you have in combination as opposed to trying to just keep adding new stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a certain confidence in being able to really focus on a particular mechanic or skill and and really diving in deep with it and looking at all the different facets of it and how people are approaching it. Not, not This is actually just part of our learning process. We begin to grok things through repetition so often we'll have people do something two times and then expect them to know it perfectly. And we have to kind of repeat it until it becomes secondhand and uh, first nature. How do you know when you've got the most out of one of these mechanics? Like, how do you know when it's time to move on, not necessarily in the progression of the game, but kind of in the design? Like, when have we got really the most value out of what this thing can offer? Early on in a game, you can focus on just a couple mechanics and you know, usually a segment, we just, one thing I learned from Mark was that we would divide the entire game up into segments and we'd create like this macro plan that kind of listed them all out. And so each segment was roughly 10 minutes. So that's what I find like in a chapter reading a book or in a mission in the game, 10 minutes is about a good segment of time where people can kind of stay focused before they want to move on to something else. The Ratchet and Clank series, over time, we just kind of learned what felt right in terms of length. Uh, it was like around 12 different setups, I think, 12 to 14 setups we would use per segment. So we knew that it would take roughly 45 seconds to complete a setup before people advanced. So you just learn these metrics and you learn about the, the cadence and the pacing and the building blocks over time. Like, oh, that was a really fun segment. You know, what was so great about, what, great about that? What was the magic behind that? And then you would just kind of analyze and say, oh, well, it has roughly... 12 setups, much like all these other cool segments. And so then you, that becomes your metric. And that's the other thing that junior designers don't do is they don't log all that information down. They don't write down all these metrics. Uh, how far does the character jump? How long is a particular mission? And really um, making sure that they're sticking to some degree of formula, knowing what the formula is and, and what's working. I love that idea of, of kind of knowing how long a, a segment needs to be before it's got to change and and then subdividing it into these setups. So then, then, you know, as a team, you can talk about it in a pretty clear way, too. This part's not working. I think divide and conquer is, is the way to go. Absolutely. Who are some other people that you look up to or whose work has really influenced you both in the game industry and, you know, outside? So maybe there's there's a particular art form or artist or designer that's meant a lot to you? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think there's a bunch of them, certainly. Uh, I've always been a big uh, Hitchcock fan and Spielberg fan. I've always enjoyed those movies uh, and the art of storytelling. When I look in, at games, um, I'm a big fan of the Naughty Dogs and, um, and the prior Naughty Dogs like Amy Hennig. Um, and then, of course, uh, Neil Druckmann, who directed the, the recent um, Uncharted, as well as um, Bruce Straley. And so uh, I think that yeah, I guess it's interesting when we're, I've been like developing the Ratchet and Clank games, just looking at both storytelling as an art form, but then platforming games and the more gamey style games. So with the Naughty Dog uh, series with Uncharted in particular, uh, I'm just really impressed how they've really developed characters, stayed true to them, and created some really great plot twists and always kind of surprising you with what's next. Uh, and then, you know, of course, I'm a big fan of Shigeru Miyamoto. Uh, and I 
I was kind of a late bloomer with Nintendo. I didn't like play all the early classics. I uh, ended up, I was kind of playing more like computer games or I was trying to make games um, back during the SNES and um, NES era. Uh, but then when the um, Nintendo 64 came along and Mario 64, I was completely blown away by that game. And I really just became a huge fan. And that was another kind of nuts and bolts of game design where I learned a lot just from playing that game. That's kind of a Spyro era game as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that was during that period. It's good to kind of analyze that style of game and figure out how we wanted to take it in a different direction, uh, especially when we started working on Ratchet and Clank. And with, with Ratchet and Clank, we, you know, obviously took it in the more of the weapons, the shooter direction, and we kind of came into our own. But I think initially we were definitely looking a lot at Zelda and Mario. I think that one of the reasons why maybe you picked up Nintendo later, it's really, I'm, I'm kind of the same. I was mm -hmm. a Genesis kid and, oh, yeah. and have become a real fan of, of Nintendo as a company. And I think, I think it's because doing design, when you start doing design and you start looking for inspiration, the work of Nintendo just pops right out on so many levels, including, for example, this economy aspect that you just brought up yeah yeah exactly i mean i remember playing through diddy kong um and t taking notes of all the different ways that they were doing vertical platforming with like ropes and how you were jumping back and forth on the different vines i believe it was just amazing at how much you could really eke out of just a few simple mechanics and this the spatial relationships of where you were jumping and where you were going this is a job that i think a lot of people see as the dream job, right? Your creative director, just direct creatively and everyone's Seriously. looking to you. Yeah, just walk yeah, in there the and point, point at some computers. <laughs> what are some of the key differences between what people think creative direction is and what, what it actually has been for you, you know, doing the work? Well, I think there's, um, at every company, it's probably a little bit different. And um, one thing to kind of note is that there's typically a creative director and a game director on some of the bigger projects. And, and the creative director tends to handle all the touchy-feely, story-related, the experience type stuff, whereas uh, the game director handles more of the design. They're pretty much what was once called the lead designer. Um, but they're also kind of working hand-in-hand -hand with the creative director to make sure both the story and game design flow together. But yeah, I think that well, the one thing that, um, this goes back to the economy of design and really the economy of creativity. You know, people do think that the director just has this, these wild ideas and they can just kind of say anything and it's going to get made. And it's like whatever they can imagine um, will appear on the screen. And that's certainly not the case. Um, there certainly is a lot of power and you have a lot of uh, influence over the direction of the game. But you have to think about production and what your budgets are and what you can actually do technically. And then you also have to um, be able to understand how to work with the team and listen to the team. I think that's a big thing that, that people don't think about is that you are working with a group of very talented people and that through this, your collective efforts, you're going to develop an amazing product. I've found that whenever you know, either I or someone else, a director starts to become a little too um, kind of dictatory, I don't know if that's a word, but they're pretty much trying to call all the shots, um, people start to rebel in their own ways and they just don't like being ordered you know, what to do. So you know, for being a being a director, it's like it's a number of different things. Um, you know, one is you're always kind of holding the vision. You're always ensuring that um, what what we're all talking about, we're all moving in the right direction. Um, so often, there's so many different documents, and things are changing constantly. And the one person that kind of has the idea of what this game is all about, it's kind of in their head, and they, they're still listening to people and, and changing that vision. But they're the ones that continually have to communicate it and make sure that the documents get updated and people know what they're making. Because it's very hazy uh, early on when they get the game vision is just a few prototypes and a few ideas. Uh, and then the other thing they do is they um, help provide some structure and are putting together the story structure and the design structure. Uh, at Insomniac, we've always put together that macro plan, which is a document that sort of, sort of sums up how all the pieces of the game fit together. And it also includes some of the story elements too. Uh, and then the, the creative director also works with the writer in terms of creating the scripts and the story documents. And so all of that structure really helps the team get an idea of what the vision is and where things are going. And then um, another aspect of, of being a creative director is 
um, having just that toolbox of ideas of how to solve a lot of creative problems, of using various techniques uh, that um, are used in both filmmaking and game design. And this is stuff that we've you know, learned from movies or that we've just experienced over the years um, of making games. Uh, and then uh, a couple more things. Um, I've got my, my list of five things that creative directors oh, good. Good, kind good. Of all to you right now. <laughs> Uh, is being a creative leader and just being able to work well with people. And that's, that's huge. Sort of um, modeling the behaviors that you want. Yeah. Yeah. People will look to the, their leads and the creative director as a role model and they'll follow suit and they'll look at how passionate you are, or how excited you are about something and realize that what they're working on is very important. So that means a lot. And, you know, there's a lot of things like just saving face. You know, if, if there's two people and they're in disagreement on which way to go, if you can kind of come into the situation and explain to them or listen to what they have to say and then look at both points of view and, you know, maybe, you know, one person, you're not going to go with their point of view, but you're saying, hey, you know what, I'm so glad you brought this up or this is a really good idea. Uh, but then you have to make a decision and explain like, well, I think we just need to go this way. And you could say there's a lot of valid points on both sides here, but I, you know, I think the best way for the game is to go right or left. And that way, people don't feel slighted. They feel like they um, both got to contribute, they were heard, and they respect that decisiveness. Um, whereas I think in some companies, you might say, oh, that's a ridiculous idea. Why would we do that? And people feel shamed in front of their peers. And they may, you may not even realize, you may just think you're kind of being funny, but they might take it to heart and then say, well, that's the last time I'm pitching an idea. Right. And then you lose out on their ideas. Yeah, exactly. My final thing about being a creative director is, is knowing production, too. And that's the other thing that can be problematic is there are a lot of directors that get into making games and they may not have really made a lot of games before. And that can be a disaster because, again, they're trying to call these shots and they don't know what they're asking for. And so once you start to understand what goes into making games and how long it takes to build and rig and animate a character then you can't just make these off-the-cuff requests. You, you are thoughtful about picking your battles. Many of those five bits also apply to production and pr the producer. I know that, for example, Ubisoft, they basically have, their, their like two leads will be like a creative and a production, the equivalent of sort of the game director and the creative director, but, but actually kind of mixed between production and, and creative. Because production also has to make decisions with a lot of competing goods and also has to model the behaviors that they want from the team. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, that's that's kind of how it works at Insomniac. I forgot to mention that part. There is the um, game director, creative director, and there's a project manager, and they really focus solely on the schedule. And there's a, actually a group of project managers that all kind of work together, and you kind of divide and conquer different portions of the game. Um, but it's hard, you know, when you're working with a project manager for them not to always appear to be the bad cop. So the creative director is like, I got this great idea. I'm curious of those. So if you have a creative director, a game director and a project manager, who runs the P&L? Like who's actually responsible for, you know, the success of the product? Um, you know, it's both the creative director and the project manager. And certainly we have, you know, it's the equivalent of a um, executive producer. And that's... Um, Someone like you know, Ted Price, who's our CEO, and he, um, he he'll come down. He'll you know essentially make the final decision if it oh, comes. Yeah, yeah. I guess that works for a studio um, that that's you know doing one or two products at a time. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, but usually, the way it's worked in the past is the creative director tends to make the final call. But you know, if they're a good creative director, they're listening to their project manager and, and um, game director. Now, one of the things I, I was excited to have you on to talk about is, you know, what to do in situations, because uh, I think this is something that lots of people um, all over the game industry and other, other industries, too, they run into situations where, you know, they, they're giving feedback on something, and they don't quite know how to express the thing as well as the person doing the work. So they're getting, you know, they're, for example you know, audio, right? Like you're doing creative direction, the audio clearly fits inside the kind of ambience of the experience and all the bits that go into the storytelling and the uh, the feeling that the players are going to get with the game. But the, uh, the audio person may have a, just a much larger vocabulary, you know, for music and they understand the instrumentation and the way that the rhythm, all these things affect the feel um, to a greater degree of granularity than 
than maybe the game director does. How do you interact in a, in a in those sorts of situations? Uh, that's a great question. And um, when I was a more novice creative director, I felt like I had to be prescriptive and tell exactly you know what needs to be done. I would try to. I would sometimes like hum the music or I would you know, <laughs> try to use terms like, you know, add, add in the percussive beats here. And I l- later learned that uh, there's two things. Uh, and this is actually um, two things in, in, a, in a book that I'm working on. Uh, one is that um, you have to direct with emotion. So explain what you want the player to feel and and talk more about, you know, that level of emotion that they would experience and give context for where this feeling's happening within the game. So you might say, well, at this moment, you know, the main character just lost their partner and they're devastated and they don't want to go on and they've completely given up. And so that's we want this feeling of isolation and loneliness. And then from there, the composer can come in and try to come up with a score that works with that. And early on, you might have like you like the way you would talk to an actor. You wouldn't say to the actor, like, frown deeper. You would express right. more how they're feeling. Yeah. It's like, what's you know, the, you know, the classic lines? What's my motivation? Right. Oh, and so you have to talk about what the motivation is. And that goes along with the state the problem, not the solution. Um, there's so many people on the team who just love to solve problems. And a lot of times, you know, they'll be so close to working on something that that you you might come in for five minutes and say, well, we got this problem. And if you try to force in a solution, then they're just going to do it. But they've probably been thinking about this problem for like, a full day and so they probably have a lot more ideas that are better fit for solving it right and, and of course the individual contributors are, are going to have a, a, a larger toolkit in their specific subdomain so moving on to your book directing video games 101 right that's right yeah i've been working on this book for six years now which is kind of crazy oh my gosh that's amazing <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's not easy um, working in, in games and then trying to, you know, live a life and then also work on a book. So uh, I, I decided to put a book together that was 101 tips and techniques. And so these are little things that I've learned over the years. And it's the book that I wanted to have when I was about, I'd say, 15 uh, in high school, wondering what does a director do, like a film director? Back then, there weren't game directors but I just kind of wrote that for my younger self or whoever's out there who's maybe curious about getting the games. But then I also realized that these are just common problems that I often forget, that directors often forget, and that creative professionals can benefit from. So they are kind of those universal principles and truths, uh, you know, anywhere from, um, you know, know your core game loop to um, the art of the jump scare uh, to what is a, um, a story MacGuffin, and just elements like that, you know, how to direct the player's attention, guide them through a level. So I think there's a lot of helpful things that seasoned professionals can uh, learn from, too. Could you take us through some of the tips and techniques, maybe a, a two or three that, that uh, you can share with our audience? I guess directing attention is a good one. Um, there's a lot of different ways to guide people you know, through a level. Um, you know, an example might be, uh, you can use breadcrumbs. So if someone walks into a space and you're kind of hoping, well, I want them to go find the hidden treasure chest, you can add like a bloody trail of footprints and that will guide them over. Or you might find this cool archway that sort of frames a particular location. And so people will tend to walk through the archway and then they'll be able to see this magnificent view. Uh, another common um, technique is that you, and these are all, this is actually all part of one tip, what I'm describing right now. Um, another technique is you put a dead end at a really cool vista. So you you have them walk to the end of this T-junction, and then they're forced to look at this cool view, and then they have to like turn right or turn left to advance. A little, little Final Fantasy moment right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then a lot of times motion is actually another key thing. Anything that moves in the level, people will immediately look at it. I think it's we have this instinctive response to determine if something's a uh, friend or foe light as well right like i see a lot of bright things i kind of know yes. going over yep. there right yeah it's you know, drawing a moth to a flame yeah I, that's that's there too sometimes i'll play games with some friends who aren't who aren't gamers and you know i'm usually the one playing and i was like how did you know to do that you know they think that i'm like brilliant but in fact right. i just know the sort of grammar of what to look at you know in the room yeah yeah, exactly. If there's, if there's a flickering uh, light bulb, you know, in the room of dim lights, <laughs> that's probably where you need to go. You know? Right. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, and I think that's the thing is a lot of people have collective visual and game grammar you know, in their subconscious. And so that's something that, uh, that's another tip on just not reinventing the wheel. You know, there's certain things that uh, we as gamers inherently know. You expect the fire button to be on the right trigger. You know, don't move it to the left trigger. Don't be clever and try to move it somewhere else. And it can be tempting just to try to do something a little bit different. You know, typically jump is always on X, if it's, a, if it's the PlayStation and then uh, jump or, and swing or melee is on square. And that's been kind of a standard. Yeah. So then I guess, uh, let's see, another tip here would be I'm just kind of looking at uh, various ones. Uh, there's the class. We classic. got a hundred left. So I know, I know. <laughs> I don't have kind of like drawing a blank and stuff. Um, actually, so, so one of them that I've found is in terms of decision making is um, to sleep on um, difficult mm. problems. Uh, the pressure that I think a lot of directors face is that they just want to make a quick and decisive decision immediately. And they think that if they do that, they won't appear to be waffling or indecisive. And this is just a common leadership problem. Uh, I've, I've sometimes made a rash decision and then I had to kind of go back on it. And it's like, oh, all of the troops are moving this way. And then you're suddenly like, OK, go back, go back or stop, stop. And and that really can be demoralizing. You know, if there are really simple problems and that have like a low impact, then you should make, be very decisive with those because when you reverse or course correct on those, it doesn't have such a big impact. And and part of it is just um, moving forward. You have to always keep production moving forward. So you have to find that balance between, OK, this is an easy problem. We're going to make a decision. We'll move forward with it. And you know what? Even if I made the wrong mistake, it's not going to be deadly to the project. If you have like a really big meteor issue, it's best to sleep on it, talk to the leads, kind of gather an opinion from the team and then figure out what's best to move forward and and then explain that and talk about your rationale behind making that big decision. So sleeping on it is great. People will know that you, you know, are actually considering, you know, and, mm-hmm. and then explaining your rationale. I mean, that, that's something I try to do when I'm making a decision is just even if I disagree with you, I'll tell you some sort of why. Because even if you don't agree with my reason, at least you know that I've, you know, in addition to hearing you, you mentioned like, you know, you want to, you know, express their reason as well. Like, I know you want this because of these reasons and and that makes sense. I'm going to go this way because of this other thing. And even if they disagree with the, you know, relative importance, you know, people will respect that you've, you've, you know, considered all that. Yeah, yeah, they want to people I think people want to make sure that you're being very thoughtful, you know, with your decision and that's not just completely off the cuff and that you're not going to change your mind. And they do like knowing what is that why? What is the the motivation um behind it? Yeah, I think um yeah, I think that's yeah, people also want to know how it fits into the greater picture too. You know, what is the context of why this decision is being made? How does it mm-hmm. connect to everything else? So, let's see. I got one more tip for you here. All right, yeah, lay it uh, on us. Well, I think um, I think the, the thing that goes back to one of them is what I call finding your magic beans. And this is early on in production. But it's essentially those, uh, I guess, seeds that grow the project. And this is something that we learned um, with Girl with a Stick, where we didn't really have a great high concept. We didn't, we didn't um, get something that was that kernel of an idea that really motivated the team. And with Ratchet and Clank, and this credit goes to um, uh, this guy, Brian Hastings, our chief creative officer. He said, I want to make a game about an alien that travels from planet to planet collecting weapons and gadgets. And that's what got everyone excited. And what that gave people was a And that is a great idea. There's just yeah. nothing, no way around it. It gives you that who, what, and where. You know, you, And ever, suddenly, the character artists can start drawing aliens. Designers can start coming up with weapons and gadgets. And the uh, environment artists can start coming up with worlds. And so that was something that really fueled the game and that we, we clung to throughout the entire um, production process. Do you think it can help people in other parts of the industry or even outside the industry? Yeah, I, I wrote this book with the idea that it would be a lot of broad principles that um, won't, won't go out, out of date. You know, I'd like to think that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, they, they still apply. And I think that they apply with for all facets of production. Um, just simply being a leader or, or learning how to work well with people on a team, very beneficial. I think, um, you know, we all, you know, a lot of times on these really big projects, people are kind of these mini creative directors, you know, the, the, the senior designers or the designers are heading up their own features. And so they can certainly benefit from some of those creative techniques. 
I think, um, you know, every creative director uh, or leader's dream is just to be able to review a level and look at a feature and say, wow, this is all working. This is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I don't have to give anything here. You know, thank you. <laughs> and, and so I think, um, by being your own mini creative director, you can um, apply a lot of these principles and figure that stuff out. You know, I was actually curious to, to know if in the process of kind of putting together this book, if all your skills, you know, working on things like Ratchet and Clank, if you're able to bring some of that into your authorship. It's one of those things, if you want to really learn a subject well, try to teach it. You know, I, I would often find that I'd be reminded I'd be working on a Ratchet and Clank project just be like, oh, that's right. You know, I, I need to, you know, we've created a, like one of my tips is creating a platypus. And it's about trying to glom on all these different ideas into one idea. And it ends up becoming this like freak of nature that doesn't make any sense. And it's trying oh, to. Oh, man, I've been there several times. Yeah. There's only one product that everyone's working on. So it's like their only chance to get this stuff in. Yeah. And they just want to kind of shove it in or they, it, it's a great idea on its own, but it doesn't, may not work well with this other idea. So those are like little things that would just kind of pop up in my head. I'm like, I need to write this down and I need to remember this. So that's part of where this book uh, came from. I think, you know, for me, it's just important that we continue to learn and, and educate ourselves. And I'm not just saying this because I want people to buy my book. <laughs> but, uh, recently, kind of gone through a lot of different changes with uh, my path. I became, um, I worked on a virtual reality project just recently called Edge of Nowhere. And there's a lot of examples in the book on that. But I found that everything that I thought about in storytelling kind of got turned on its head with VR. And that was really exciting to be able to be in this new arena to rethink my traditional um, methods of how I would approach uh, storytelling and design. And so I think that, uh, you know, I'm getting older and part of me just wants to share some of this wisdom that I've gained over 25 or so years. But I also want to stay um, agile and be able to um, learn new techniques and and just be open to new ideas. And I think that's something we need to continually do. I agree. You know, this podcast is my way of, you know, both sharing and and continuing to grow myself. So thank you very much for for coming on. And, and I hope you'll come back again. Yes. And I do have to mention the website of my book, too. Of course. Of course. We'll is, also post it on the blog Okay. Uh, as well. But yes, please. It's, and um, anything else, anywhere else you people can find you, Brian? Oh, sure thing. Yeah. It's directingvideogames.com. So you can go there to sign up um, for updates on the book. And then um, I'm also at Brian Allgaier, B-R-I-N-A-L-L-G-E-I-E-R -E -E for my Twitter account. So you can uh, contact me there. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Jordan. It was my pleasure. So a couple things as we close out this episode. First of all, another thank you to Brian for coming on the show and also for giving so much useful information and sharing with the community here. I really appreciate that. And I know that a lot of our listeners are going to get a lot out of this episode. Now, there were a couple interesting things that popped out to me between this episode and the previous episode with Dave Roll, where there were kind of like um, harmonies. So one of those was the economy of design and, and wringing the most out of each mechanic. I thought it was interesting that, you know, Dave, who's doing a lot of mobile casual, really focused on that as a way to, you know, be agile, to find what works best and to make the most out of what works best when you don't have a lot of resources, when you don't have a lot of time, when you don't have a huge team. And then you had Brian, who basically made the same exact point, but in reference to huge AAA games where you have enormous resources but moving the ship is a lot of work and changing direction is incredibly disruptive to huge numbers of people and also you have a case with these bigger projects where you know the level of, of sheen and shine you need to put on each mechanic for it to be complete is humongous so he and dave both emphasized this economy of design and really wringing every last drop of value out of each mechanic. And certainly that's something that, you know, when I think of that kind of way of design, I, I think of companies like Nintendo that really put in a mechanic and explore it and exhaust it completely as you master it. So I thought it was really interesting the way they both talked about that. And also Brian and Dave both mentioned Mark Cerny. So he's an industry legend and I know he's doing a lot of work with Sony now. I'm going to see about getting him on the show because I think it would be amazing to interview him given the influence that he's clearly had 
on the industry. So just a couple thoughts to close out the interview. What was interesting to you and who would you like to see on the show? You can let me know, jordan at brightblack.co. Thanks for listening and I'll see you on the next episode. Mm-hmm.